In other lectures, we've talked about the arrangement of leaves on stems, we've talked about the venation, we've talked about the difference between simple and compound leaves, and several other features. Today, we are going to dive inside the leaf, and instead of looking at the external features, we're going to look at what's going on between the two epidermal layers. Incidentally, the picture that we're looking at here in the background is leaf epidermis. The cells of the epidermis are complex, almost jigsaw-like shapes that are pretty cool to look at. In this lecture, we're going to start by looking at the epidermis itself, as well as the stomata, the openings for gas exchange. Then we'll spend the rest of the time looking at the mesophyll, the space between those two epidermises, and we'll talk about the palisade mesophyll at the top and the spongy mesophyll that occurs near the bottom. We will also talk about the organization of vascular bundles, including where is the xylem and where is the phloem, and we'll talk a little bit about the role of support tissues, including colenchyma and fibers, in holding the leaves up. Let's get going then. As we just said um, on the previous slide, the leaf epidermis is a complex tissue. We've talked about epidermis tissue before in the context of tissues. Remember that as a complex tissue, it includes different cell types. Here it's going to include stomata, and so stomata themselves aren't cell types, but the guard cells that surround each opening are a particular kind of cell. And so you can see where I'm moving the mouse, a stoma, stoma is the singular of stomata, and there are two guard cells around it. There's another open stomata up here, it looks sort of like two lips, and there's a tightly closed stomata where I'm moving the mouse down near the D label here. Remember also that the epidermis is going to have trichomes. We'll talk about one of the functions of trichomes momentarily, but remember there were a few different functions that you read about. Um, in fact, we will talk about um, the functions right now of the epidermis itself. So one function of the epidermis that we continually come back to is that it prevents water loss. Remember it has a layer of impermeable um, substance formed from coudin and wax on its surface, and because those are not water permeable, it holds water inside the leaf. Additionally, this is a barrier to pathogens, which will have difficulty getting through the cutaneous layer. The next thing that we'll consider with regard to the epidermis is where are the stomata? And as you can see in this picture here, this is a picture of oleander, um, a leaf that grows in the Mediterranean region. The stomata are typically on the lower leaf surface. So here's one opening or one stoma. Here's a second one. And I'm guessing that this right here is sort of a stomata that in this particular cross section of the leaf, we only got the very edge of it. So it looks like it doesn't go in as far. Um, and so we should ask, why are the stomata on the lower surface of the leaf, but not the upper surface? There are a couple of reasons that your book discusses. The first is that water vapor um, is going to be the form that water gets lost from the leaves. And when water vapor diffuses through the leaf bottom, it can sort of hang around. It's got some chance of diffusing back in. And if it diffuses away slowly, that's going to slow down additional water loss from the leaf. In contrast, if the stomata were up here at the top, then when that water vapor left the leaf, it would be leaving into a warmer, sunnier environment. And because the sun it would add energy to those water molecules, they would more quickly speed away from the leaf surface. As a result, they would be less likely to diffuse back in. They would also do less to slow the loss of additional water molecules through that opening. So in many cases, we're going to see the stomata mostly aggregated on the underside of the leaf. An additional reason your book talks about is that in some areas and at some temperatures, we get accumulation of dew. So you've seen this if you go outside on a cool morning. 
on the grass or other leaf material looks wet. Well, dew is going to accumulate on the upper side of a leaf, but not on the lower side. And while plants like having water, the problem with dew is that the gases are not going to diffuse very effectively through that water layer. And so, in effect, that water layer would prevent diffusion of gases and therefore prevent photosynthesis from occurring. By having the openings on the bottom, dew is not a problem. We don't have the layer of water and gases can start diffusing in um, in the morning when the plant is ready to perform photosynthesis. So I've just told you that stomata are on the bottom of the leaf. And if we look over at this picture here of a corn leaf, you can see that on the bottom of the leaf, indeed, we do have several different stomata. And if you look at the upper layer here, oh, what's this? Oh, there's a stomata here. And over here, you can see a very clear stomata. And you can see even a couple more here. So what's going on? This is not as I told you. Um, in fact, in grasses like corn, and you can see a picture of corn here. Um, as an aside, you should know that corn is in fact a grass. It's a very tall grass that we happen to eat, but nonetheless, it's in the grass family. So in corn, as well as other grasses, we in fact get stomata on the upper surface as well as the lower surface of the leaf. So why is that? Let's um, look back over here at the um, drawing or illustration of corn, and we can see why that is. What I want you to notice is that in some cases, the leaves are oriented more or less horizontally, but pretty quickly the leaves become heavy and they start folding downwards. That means this leaf surface is oriented more or less vertically. And that's also true in these areas where the leaf is angled upward. Uh, it's not exactly vertical, but it's closer to vertical than a typical die-cut leaf. Well, if this is the case, then all of these things that we talked about, about why water would evaporate faster from the upper side of a leaf than the lower side, they don't really apply. In this case here, this is the lower side of the leaf, but it's equally exposed to the sun as the opposite side, the upper side of this leaf. Similarly, both sides of this leaf would have similar exposure to dew. So in the case of something like a grass where the leaves are not mostly held horizontally, then there's no particular advantage to having the stomata on the lower side. And instead what we see is that there's a similar distribution of stomata on both surfaces. We'll come back and look at this cross section of a corn leaf in a little bit. While we're talking about the epidermis, let's think a little bit about the thickness. I've shown you the cross section now of two leaves. One was oleander, and I mentioned in passing this grows in a Mediterranean environment. We should specify that in a Mediterranean environment, at least seasonally, it's very dry. There are some seasons where it's rainy and there's lots of water, but then there's going to be typically a period of months where there's almost no rain and the plants still need to survive that. That means they need to be really good at holding on to water. Let's contrast that with corn, whose leaf cross section is shown over here. Corn typically grows in a moist environment. That's not necessarily because it um, naturally does, but rather because if we're growing corn, then at least wherever we're able to, we are going to be providing water in the form of irrigation. Conversely, if the area is too dry, we'll be growing some other crop instead of corn. So a corn plant in practice can assume it's going to get water. Let's look at the influence of this difference in the moisture environment between the two plants. Starting with the corn, what we see is a single layer epidermis. It's literally one cell thick. You can see it does have this coudin layer on the surface, um, it's a mix of coudin and wax. Um, let's contrast that with what we see for the oleander over here on the right. Here, again, we see that layer of coudin on the surface, but it's exceptionally thick. We also see that the epidermis, instead of being a single layer, appears to be about three layers thick. So these additional layers of epidermal cells are going to be helping 
to um, further contain moisture and as a result it's going to help the plant survive during the dry season. That's about all we'll have to say about the epidermal layers. Let's move inside the leaf now and look at the mesophyll. Meso means middle, phyll means leaf, so when we say mesophyll we're talking about the middle of the leaf, everything between the two epidermis layers. And in most leaves, we're going to see that this is divided into the palisade mesophyll, which is typically the upper layer, and the spongy mesophyll, which is typically the lower layer. We'll talk about each of those momentarily. We'll start with the palisade layer. A palisade, if you're not familiar with the word more generally, if you picture a very old-fashioned fence, maybe around a fort, where um, people have just taken trunks of trees and sharpened the tops of them and then driven them into the ground one after the other. That would be a palisade um, fence. And so we take the word palisade to refer to the mesophyll because it's similar in orientation. It's kind of like having trunks lined up one after the other forming a boundary. So as implied by that analogy, palisade cells are ver vertically oriented. They go up and down. Now in this diagram, it looks like they're pretty much attached to one another along their seams. But as your book points out, and if you look at the diagram in your book, they sort of exaggerate this feature to make it even easier to see. There's actually air spaces between each of these palisade cells. And really the palisade cells are mostly attached up here at the surface. They're not so much attached to one another. That's going to be important because the palisade cells are the primary cells that perform photosynthesis, which is our fourth bullet point down here. So in order to perform photosynthesis, remember the cells are going to need carbon dioxide. They will also need to be able to get rid of excess oxygen, which is the waste product of the process. So they're going to do that by emitting it from the cells, and then it has to diffuse away through the pores. Having openings between the cells creates more airspace for the oxygen to diffuse away and the carbon dioxide to diffuse into the cells. Something else to note, which is sort of evident in this diagram, um, each of these green kidney-shaped objects in the cells is a chloroplast. And chloroplasts are going to be the organs where um, most reactions pertaining to photosynthesis occur. So the fact that these palisade cells have a lot of chloroplasts relates to their function in performing photosynthesis. As a sort of foreshadowing, if you look down at these cells beneath, they have fewer chloroplasts. We'll come back to that idea on the next slide. So if you think about the process of photosynthesis, of course it's powered by sunlight. So let's think about why is it that the cells at the upper surface of the leaf are the ones that are more photosynthetically active. Of course sunlight comes from the sun, which is above. That means that most of the sunlight that hits this leaf is going to probably make it through the epidermis and then it's going to be absorbed in the upper layers of the leaf. It makes sense then that the plant is focusing its ability to perform photosynthesis in the top of the leaf and is less concerned with performing photosynthesis in the lower half since less light is going to reach the lower half anyway. So let's talk then about what is happening in the lower half of this leaf. In the lower half, we have spongy mesophyll. It's called spongy because it looks sort of like the structure of your sponge. There are cells and they sort of connect to one another and they create this network. This network is going to be important for allowing substances to move from cell to cell, um, especially when we start thinking about vascular bundles which are omitted from the diagram we're looking at here. But these cells are less important for actually performing photosynthesis. So the cells sort of have a branching arrangement where multiple cells form branches that connect to one another. Notice how much space there is for air in the lower half of this leaf. That makes sense. It doesn't need a lot of cells down here because it's not performing photosynthesis but the leaf does need clear passages for gases to be able to diffuse 
through the stoma up to the palisade mesophyll and also from the palisade mesophyll back out through the stoma. So by having few cells, it creates larger air spaces. We've already mentioned this, but I'll just say it again for completeness. The cells in the spongy layer have fewer chloroplasts. Typically, um, we'll go back to the last diagram momentarily. As in this diagram, a typical leaf arrangement would be to have exactly one layer of palisade cells at the upper surface of the leaf. Let's look at what happens in the oleander, which we were looking at previously. We said it grows in dry environments. It's also true that this grows in fairly sunny environments. With that in mind, look at the palisade cells. You can see them, they're vertically oriented in this sort of fence-like arrangement. But what I want you to notice is that there's not just one layer of palisade, there's actually two layers. One layer where I'm moving the mouse now, then the second layer beneath it. So in this case, because it's a sunny environment, there's going to be a lot of light availability, and this is a more efficient arrangement where these lower palisade cells can still acquire um, sunlight, and by stacking two layers thick of palisade here, it can get more photosynthesis in a given leaf, which means it needs fewer leaves. This is going to be important because fewer leaves also means less water loss. If each leaf has stoma or stomata, and each one of those stomata can lose water, then if the plant can pack more photosynthesis into fewer leaves, then it's going to have less opportunities for water loss through those stomata. Now, we just looked at layers of palisade mesophyll and layers of spongy mesophyll. So let's go back to our corn leaf that I told you we'd come back to and look at the two layers, except, except what I think you've probably noticed already is that there's not a clearly defined palisade layer and spongy layer. In fact, if you look at the top of this leaf, draw a line through it like so, look at everything above that line compared to below that line, and it looks virtually identical. Um, if you folded this over on itself, it would almost match up. So it's nearly symmetric bottom to top. So why is that that the corn is again doing something different? Well, there's a couple of reasons for this. One relates to the fact that it does photosynthesis a little bit differently than most plants do. And we will gloss over that reason here. Instead, we're going to go back and focus on the fact that a typical corn leaf is not oriented as it is in this um, picture here. They're not typically horizontal. Instead, as we've already talked about, this leaf would likely be angled upward or even nearly vertical. As we've already said, if it's vertical, that means that sunlight can hit both sides of it. And if sunlight can hit both sides, it does not make sense to have one side that is specialized for photosynthesis and the other side specialized for gas exchange. Instead, you can see that the photosynthetic cells are mostly in these areas near the vascular bundles, and they are similar on both sides of the leaves. So we've talked a bunch about the structure of the vasculature, but we've totally glossed over how substances make it into the leaf, and also once that leaf performs photosynthesis and makes sugar, how that sugar can be exported from the leaf elsewhere. So we need to talk about the vasculature which, as you already know from several lectures, is the method that the plant, or the, uh, the structures through which the plant conducts materials. So here we have a cross-section of a leaf. It happens to be a dandelion, or a taraxicum is the scientific name. Um, oh, so it's a leaf from dandelion. And you can see a pretty clear vascular bundle right here. Looking at this, even without my labels, you should be able to tell what is xylem, what is phloem, and what is fibrous. So at the very top of this vascular bundle, you see these really large openings. Um, these large openings 
tell you that these must be uh, vessel members, and vessel members, of course, are part of the xylem. So the xylem is at the top, and you already expect that if the xylem is at the top, then we must have phloem too, and so the phloem is going to be the next layer beneath it right here. Now the next layer down, I've labeled as fibers here. That's technically not correct because these are cholenchyma, not sclerenchyma. So I really should have labeled this instead as cholenchyma cells. Um, remember that in a stem vein, we typically would have either cholenchyma or actual sclerenchyma fibers on the phloem side of that vein. Well, the same thing is true here. So these fibers are going to be, in part, protecting the vascular bundle, but they're also going to be instrumental in holding the leaf out. The plant probably doesn't want the leaf to droop, and so by having supportive material, it can hold it at an appropriate angle. There's one more layer around this vascular bundle that we should notice, and it's not terribly distinct here, but if you sort of... Um, but your eyes go a little bit fuzzy and look at this, you can see that there's a circle of cells that is continuous the whole way around the vascular bundle. That is going to be the bundle sheath. It does not have thick secondary walls, and that makes it harder to distinguish. Nonetheless, this can still be important physiologically. Now, we just said that the structural material in the dandelion leaf was technically uh, cholenchyma, even though I had it uh, labeled as fibers. Let's go back now and look at the corn leaf another time. And what you can see is that in the corn leaf, the supportive material actually has very thick secondary cell walls, and they stain red. We've looked at enough slides now of stained plant material that you should sort of have caught on to the fact that if the cell walls are thick and stain red, then that must mean the cell walls are sclerenchyma, not cholenchyma. So in this case, the corn leaf has two bundles of fibers, and these are true fibers because they are sclerenchyma, one at the upper surface of the leaf and one at the lower surface. These are going to do a couple of things. First, corn leaves are really large, and so this is going to help support the corn leaf along its entire length. Second, um, if you've ever tried to eat a leaf with a lot of true fibers in it, then you know it's very tough and hard to chew on, and so secondarily, this could also deter herbivores. So some final thoughts for today's lecture. The general idea I want you to think about for almost everything we've talked about is this basic idea that form follows function. And we've discussed that idea before. Here, there are several ways you can see it, and it's typically how plant leaves vary according to the environment they are adapted to. We saw this with the epidermis leaf, or the epidermis um, thickness varying with environment. We saw that there were more epidermal layers in dry environments than moist ones. We also saw in the comparison of the support material for the corn leaves compared to the oleander that we have stronger supportive material in the corn leaves, which can be a couple of feet long compared to the oleander leaves, which are only a few inches long. Third, we saw that the distribution of stomata varies with the leaf orientation. So in environments where both sides of the leaves are exposed to sunlight, we get stomata on both sides. In environments where only the upper surface is exposed to sunlight, then the stomata are only on the bottom side. And then we also saw in the leaves that had both palisade and spongy mesophyll that the location of the palisade mesophyll and the spongy mesophyll reflected the relative importance of performing photosynthesis compared to allowing gas exchange in each of those environments. So generally throughout the course, always keep an eye on how the forms that we are talking about 
relate to the functions of the different structures.